Good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for being here. I'm Kelly Baisley, the School and Family Programs Manager. And today I'm joined by Lynn Andrews, Master Docent, and Shauna Hill, Touring Docent. They'll be leading our conversation today. Each Friday at 12 p.m., docents lead virtual interactive conversations about a few artworks in our collection or special exhibitions. The goal is simple, slow down, discover the joy of looking at art, and talk about the experience with others. For today's program, Shauna and Lynn will lead us in interactive conversations about three to four artworks in our collection. We'll spend about 15 minutes or so with each artwork and Lynn and Shauna will allow us time to look at each artwork on our own, slowly, before leading a conversation about each one with questions. As participants, we encourage you to engage in dialogue with Shauna, Lynn, myself, and each other throughout the hour. Right now, everyone's microphone is muted by default. We will have an opportunity to unmute once we get our conversation going. We suggest that you find a quiet room and close the door, and we ask that you silence alerts from any of your nearby devices. Try not to sit in front of a window or any other strong light source. We also suggest using headphones and a microphone for best sound quality, and a desktop, laptop, or tablet so that you can see the images um, nice and big on a large screen. Make sure your screen name includes your first name and last initial or last name. To ask questions or make comments during the conversation, you'll be able to unmute your microphone. You can also tap, type into the chat box or you can raise your hand in the participant sidebar and the one of us will call on you to unmute and share. We are recording today. If you prefer not to be recorded, make sure that your video and audio remain muted and use the chat box to submit any questions and comments. Does anyone have any questions before we start? Okay, Shauna, what will we be talking about today? Well, hi, I'm Shauna Hill, and together with Lynn Andrews, give us a wave, Lynn. We welcome you to the <laughs> Asheville Art Museum's Slow Art Friday. Our theme today is 3D art on a flat screen. We all have probably missed being inside the museum for a while, and some works of art are not even on display all the time when the museum is open. Let's see if there are any advantages to once in a while, slow looking on a flat screen. Are there things we can see that we might not otherwise? And are there attributes that we must see in person? All of the works of art we'll see here today are in the museum's permanent collection and represent crafts, sculpture, and painting. Um, let's begin and take some time to look at the first uh, to look, really look at our first work of art. Okay, now that we've had some time to look at this, what's going on in this work of art? Anyone? Barb? Face, and I like the texture, even though it's flat, I can feel the texture and uh, I like the colors. I, I can see the mouth, the nose, and um, um, obviously we can't touch it, but if I feel it would be soft if I did touch it. Okay, so you think that uh, what I'm hearing you say is that you can feel it? even though you can't touch it and it seems soft and that you can actually distinguish some features on it or what you're thinking is maybe a mouth. Um, so what else, what is it that you see that makes you make, 
say that it's soft? I think it's just the way that the, uh, the yarn or the fabric, the materials are um, woven and, and the loose pieces above what I now determine to be perhaps eyes and... Uh, I love you. What's that? Barbara, did you say something? Oh, you didn't, okay. I do have, I, it does look soft because it does look like fabric and it does actually in, inside the purple circle, I can actually see little teeth. I see teeth. <laughs> so inside this teeth. purple circle, you can see teeth where, where yeah. yeah, okay, thank you, Kelly. <laughs> so you're seeing teeth there. I see the teeth also. Now, I didn't see them initially, but once Barbara pointed it out, I can see the teeth as well. And it's actually the front teeth, and you can even see the molars in the back. It's quite <laughs> I Really? I mean, do you see that? Does anybody else see that? I, I see the teeth on both sides. It looks like, to me, the teeth are missing in the, in the front. But, um, yeah, that's, that's great. What, what else can we find? Did I hear uh, this is you say? This yeah, is go ahead. Barbara. Um, and before um, I, of course, it's evocative of a head of a face, but I am more interested at the moment in the technique and the colors, um, the, the weaving and the knots, um, and how chaotic it looks in some ways. You know, obviously, um, the knotting and the way that the yarn hangs loosely um, is very different than a lot of other pieces um, that would be made out of these materials. So you're identifying the, the knotting and the, and the weaving, and, um, and you're seeing a number of different types of um, weaving. I'm, mm -hmm. I'm guessing. What, where, where is the nodding to you most prevalent? What does? Well, above what we're calling this uh, mouth, this sort of purple and pink, um, those uh, not a, like on the sides. No, not <laughs> the <laughs> interior of that. The red interior. The, oh, okay. The red um, interior. You're seeing no nodding mm -hmm. and we or a, weaving. Yeah. Uh, very different than the knotting, almost raya knots, outside of the dark lines where the mouth is. Um, and then also just the looping knots uh, of, of what would be hair. So the, there, you're seeing that there's a lot of different types of stitches. There's yeah, I think that's what I'm knots. trying to figure out. As somebody who used to weave ah. um, and do macrame and different kinds of fiber arts, I'm trying to figure out the techniques. Okay, you're trying to figure out how this was made. Yes. So what, in your experience of that, how, what would you say the technique would have been, at least on one or two of these different textures? Well, the, the red underneath the hair looks like um, what I would call a raya knot, more of what was done in rug making. But the part that I'm most interested in at the moment is that the red pieces that I mentioned above the mouth. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, I think I know how that's done, mm -hmm. the, the knotting on the single threads, but I'm not sure. I think it's twining. Okay. The way, the way you wrap the string around the um, warp, or the so yarn think, around I, the warp. It, so it really could be, or it could be, an, and I don't remember what you call it, but it's like a hitching onto um, straight cords. I'm not sure. I also see it on the bottom. It looks like the entire interior of the black of the mouth and the nose. If you go below the teeth, below, yes, exactly, Kelly. Yeah. On the right, right yeah. also, you see that right. as well. Right. I would wonder how long it took to make this piece. I don't know if we have that information, but I would just be curious. 
I don't have that information, Kelly. No, it doesn't. Um, what is it that it makes us see this three-dimensionality? What are you seeing that um, conveys that this is three-dimensional? I think yeah. the texture, the te different textures, the finer texture that's in the, that we were just discussing, the linear uh -huh quality and then it goes to the black that's a little thicker and then the red seems to may be the same and then the longer strands certainly seem further out and deeper than you know the others that sort of go inward and that gives a sense of dimension to me. So the layering upon yes. um, different uh, techniques that become a little bit um, more dense and or loose or the yarn on yarn on yarn is what gives you that feeling of three-dimensionality? Yes. What can you and say about, the, oh, go ahead, please. I was just gonna say also, the fact that it's hanging on a bar implies <laughs> that it is dimensional. <laughs> okay, you know, that's a good, good giveaway. Um, does anybody <laughs> see any shades or what? Shading. Well, the black, the black yeah, shadow. Um, are almost like the creases of a mouth when you smile a lot or open a mouth if you're singing, you know, the red begonia kind of quality <laughs> as a person okay. singing okay. The, the song. What about a mood or feeling? Does anybody have about this? Angry. Angry. Hmm. Now, what, yeah. Why do you say angry? What is it that makes you say angry? Um, well, I, the color red. Um, okay. But also the way the mouth is open, like it's shouting, although I, I see it could be singing, but um, to me it looks more like shouting and the red is very, um, you know, a hot color okay. uh, that is often means anger. I, I wanted to answer to the question about three-dimensionality. Mm -hmm. On my screen, it seems to me like the hair um, that's hanging down and the purple beard or mustache around the mouth or, maybe, or lips are more in focus than the background of the face, okay. um, which indicates three-dimensionality. In other words, the camera focused on the parts closest to us more and so definitely looks three-dimensional on my screen. Okay, so just the, fo the focus, the clarity in the front and maybe fuzzier in the back. Let's right. take a closer look. There, we have a close-up of this in the next oh. slide. Mm. Any, what can you say about the texture, the form? Yes, Barbara? I think it almost looks like the very back texture, the flattest and the furthest away, looks like it's almost corduroy. So it looks like a variety of materials. And uh, some of the weave is very close together. And some of the weave is very, very loose. And I was going to say my impression was not of anger, even though red is an angry color. It looks like to me like someone yawning just when they got out of bed and their hair is all <laughs> messed up. Them. <laughs> you know, they're just first waking up. But... Um, it does look like corduroy in the back. So it looks like there's a variety of material and the weave also makes it seem more, makes the three-dimensionality apparent. Also, there's a shadow of the thicker mm -hmm. purple against yeah. the background. Right. And it was evident also in the bigger picture against the wall, there's a shadow of the Okay, so the shadow. The you can see a lot more colors. I mean, it's not just the red. You can see the oranges, the pinks, the grays, the purples, the uh, a lot more colors in there on the close-up. So how big do or small do you think this might be? Anyone? Uh, probably larger than face, you know, than a face. I'm not sure. Larger than a face, so right. more of a, a large mask-like shape. Mask shape. So, um, what would you say if I told you this is five feet by Ooh. six feet? <laughs> wow! Um, Can we see the I full? Yeah, you want to go back, Kelly? Thank yeah. you. Yeah. Wow! Wow! Imposing. 
when it's that size. It is. This is um, called Ruby Begonia. For those of you at the museum that might have seen this before, it's done, um, it is created by uh, Sue Ferguson, who is a, uh, describes herself as a fiber artist, a sewist, a collage maker, and a big fan of the Arizona deserts. That might be where the red comes <laughs> from. She holds two academic agree degrees in English writing, spent 40 years in agriculture, marketing and teaching, and went on a hiatus, uh, visited Sedona, Arizona, and uh, discovered her passion for weaving and fiber art. So this is like a second career because she spent 40 years in her original career. She believes that she, she works with a, a rigid heddle loom for those of you who, who we weave or have had experience there. Um, and she uses uh, her fingers mostly, but a shuttle sometimes. Uh, imagination and hope drive her selection of fibers and colors. And she describes her work as often messy. Do we see the messy here? Uh, with yeah. untrimmed strands of yarn dangling and she favors unkempt asymmetrical forms says it reflects the way she sees and navigates through the world. She resides in Missouri and she has an Etsy shop called Beautifully Woven with accessibly priced wall art and art to wear. So any comments knowing uh, any of that particular information? Well, uh, the name Begonia, um, now I'm not sure if it's a face or a human or a, a flower, but once I thought about flower, it reminds me of Georgia O'Keeffe's paintings. Mm -hmm. You know, how she takes those flowers and opens up, and I actually can see it completely differently now. I, I always saw it as a puppy. puppy. Oh. I don't know if anyone else sees that with uh, like shaggy bangs hanging down and a muzzle. Not a muzzle, but the, that part of their face. I see that. Yeah, I see that. And the floppy ears. Mm -hmm. And the nose, little dog nose maybe. Oh. Yeah. Interesting. The red is something that throws me off from that, but I do see what you're talking, you know, all the images you're referring to. Uh, which so, actually seem more real than a face. So back you know, to the dog features. Oh, I'm sorry. So back to our theme of 3D art on a flat screen. How would you think that there are advantages or disadvantages to seeing this on a flat screen versus in person? Anyone? I've seen this in person. And one of the things that I noticed with this that I didn't before is how linear it is. And particularly in terms of the hair, the way it moves all around and, you know, very energetic, a lot of different kinds of lines, which you don't tend to notice as much in a three-dimensional work. Yeah, I agree that, that um, there are a number of things you can see in, close up that you would never have been able to get your face that close to the work of art in the gallery. Um, so there are some advantages to uh, looking at it uh, on a flat screen. Well, uh, Lynn, you have another work of art that is going to um, surprise us. You want to take this, take it away. Thank you, Shona. Now that everybody has gotten warmed up for our conversation, take uh, 30 seconds and just to look at this work and try to notice what your first impressions are, your immediate thoughts and feelings. I see it as an abstracted flower arrangement. Abstracted flower arrangement. There, yeah. um, and what makes you say that? 
Uh, well, the forms. The blue has a calla look to it. Mm -hmm. uh, the pink in the center has a carnation or maybe a peony, peony uh, look to it. So, and then the caladium off to the lower left, uh, and, and then the green at the top. But there's a lot of activity. It's very dynamic. Very dynamic. Um, do I see it as a quiet object, actually, um, almost like an animal, maybe because of the dog dis discussion we had just on the previous one. But it seems like a long snout to me and an ear and then sort of graceful lips. The blue that uh, Billy was talking about is more the, the mouth. I'm not sure what the uh, peony or chrysanthemum might be. Aren't our imaginations but, wonderful to see such different things in the same piece? Who else sees something that hasn't been mentioned? I, I see, see a like person flat flower. I, 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 I see, see a person holding the flowers. Let's see. I see the green as evocative oh, of cool. a person's shape, and then the movement oh, towards yeah. the more colorful being the bouquet. Oh, very I see a person, but I look to me like she's blowing glass. I'm struck by the light, and it almost looks like she has a head and a mouth and some sort of pipette and maybe blowing those flowers like glass blowing. Interesting. Barbara Pressman and Barbara H., you were both um, trying to say something. Barbara Pressman, did you have a comment? Uh, yeah, I was going to say, to me, it's very whimsical. I, there is just something about the textures of it that it makes me almost, I know I'm not allowed to touch, but makes me want to touch it because it feels like the green and the blue are kind of almost feels like it might be soft fabric. There's just... I, it's kind of magical. I'm not, you know, I see the flowers. I don't see any people in it. Uh, I'm going to try to look for them, but I just feel like it just feels just so the light, it makes it so whimsical. Reflecting Bar through it. Oh, I'm sorry, Barbara, for interrupting. So, yeah, I'm going to. Okay. Barbara H., did you have something you wanted to add? No, I was the one who said that the green to me was evocative of a, per, a, a shape of a person. And oh, yeah. the other colors, the purple and the blue, seemed to me a bouquet. Oh to be something that they're holding. That's very interesting. Well, when 3D art is re-rendered for viewing on a flat screen, the third dimension is often lost. And unlike paintings, drawings, and photographs, 3D art is forever changing as the light and the viewing angle changes. So when you look at this on a flat screen, what are the elements of this work that signal that it's three-dimensional? Shadow. Shadow. And um, Kelly, can you kind of run your pointer along the shadows that are on the uh, left-hand side? Yeah. All along there. Mm -hmm. And also all the way around uh, under the blue piece and at the bottom of the green, all the way down at the bottom. Lots of shadows. Uh, it's interesting that these three works that were selected they're sculptures, but they're all wall sculptures. So where normally you'd be able to walk around the sculpture, these, you, even if you were in front of it, you, you could walk it from side to side, walk from side to side, but you'd be looking at it straight on. Does the photo give you any clues as to how large the piece is? Well, the neon light behind it uh, indicates that's, I would guess that that light is um, 36 to 48 inches. So I would think it's rather large. Okay, Billy, anyone else have a different uh, idea? Would you like to know? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's 70 inches from top to bottom, so over yeah. five and a half feet. Mm -hmm. It's 49 inches uh, along the widest part, and maybe the one piece that um, makes the shadow so prominent is it protrudes 21 inches from the wall. Wow. Oh, wow. 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 Yeah, yeah. I want to see it from this side. <laughs> uh, you, yeah, that's something you can't yeah. do when you're looking at, looking yeah. at it on a flat screen. Flat screen. It'd and be curious to see it, to have a, a picture from the side so we would have a better sense of, of maybe what it's about. 
That's that's a good idea to add to our um, add to our uh, archive of things that we have photographed. Yes. But yes. now that you know how big it is, does it change the way that you see the piece or react to it? I don't think so. I'm still trying yeah. to ascertain the textures. I see wire. I see a lot of wire in there, and I, I it's hard for me to discern what it is that's wrapped around the wire exactly yeah the materials is, is interesting and we'll get to that in a in a second um i want to i want to ask you to use your imagination in one other way this this artist is best known for making installations works that fill whole galleries whole rooms and that visitors actually walk through imagine this piece as big as a whole room or imagine you about six inches tall uh, and you uh, walk and you're walking through it. How do you think that might feel or what what would you what would you notice? It would be like walking through a garden with the sun shining, you know, oh. on the on the garden on you. Um, that's that's what it looks like to me, like the sun mm -hmm. shining through plants. Although the size of it, um, they wouldn't be, it's, it's larger than life size for the flowers anyway. But I, I, it looks like it would be very peaceful and, um, and pleasant to walk through this garden with the sun shining on you. So um, almost peaceful. magical in its uh, aura of color and, and fabric. Ah, magical. Someone else earlier mm -hmm. said whimsical. Yeah, I said that, and um, it reminds me of something that uh, in it was like a, a light show for Christmas, and it was like an archway with all colored light. And I think walking through that would be uh, similar yeah, to fun. that kind of feeling, like uh, with all the bright colors and uh, very magical. Uh, Kelly, would you bring up the detail, please? All right, so oh, here's the detail. Ah, of nice. one end. Take a, just take a few seconds and just look at it. And then um, I want to talk about the materials because everybody's had um, thoughts about what it's made of. I, I wanted to say that it seems almost like, like walking through it, the way it's melted. It gives me the feeling of like a stop of liquid and it's a stop action of the liquid and it's just caught in like mid flow going oh through. almost like a, almost like a dew drop or something forming and dropping well you see the stop action of like a person in an environment mm -hmm. and it's like caught the liquid is caught and now it's still so um um give me some ideas of what you see that this might be made of Fabric, I'm possibly plastics that are melted or uh, folded and definitely things. various plastics. That's right. Mm -hmm. She uses okay. <coughs> she uses a lot of plastics and resins. What else? Okay. Yeah, it looks like glass. There is no glass, Barbara. I can see exactly what you mean. The blue, what especially. She, what she's done is she's stretched um, sheets of resin. Okay. Uh, and and mold and molded them. You know, you can you can make them soft with a, like a Bunsen burner, and then you can um, shape it any way you like. Interesting. And, and then the wire she, the light. she uses as a line to l outline the shape. You that's don't right. see it as much here, but that's helped me see an animal shape when it when we saw the whole thing. Although it's so big, I guess it has to be pretty s stiff wire. It's steel wire. Well, well, steel wire. Happy. Yeah, steel. and it looks to me like there could be textile. And where, where, any particular part where you see textiles? Where I see textile is maybe the peony, uh -huh. or, or what I perceive as a peony as textile. And this draping in the upper right-hand corner almost looks like a pair of pantyhose. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, well, um, the peony-shaped object, whatever it might be, uh, is actually paper. 
So um, this is made of steel wire, various plastics and paper, shellacked Chinese paper. Can anyone see that piece? There's, an, there's a taken apart, disassembled Chinese lantern. Oh, the, the, stri the, the white, stripe the purplish piece. white behind the peony. Yes, yes. Uh -huh. um, and fluorescent light. When I first saw it, I thought it was neon, but it's not neon, it's fluorescent. So who said- I think it's the fluorescent light that makes it look, when we were looking at it from further away, like glass. The light coming through that plastic sort of turns it into glass, which is, yeah. Um, so what kind of skills would an artist need to make a piece like this? And Kelly, can we go back to the full piece, please? A little electrical background. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think a painting background, because it's very painterly in its a range of colors and line playing back and forth. It, it flattens quite nicely in terms of an image, <laughs> even though it is dimensional. Uh, there's a lot of structure because especially, of the painting quality. Especially when you look at the detail, it almost looks like a painting. Yes. Yeah, you can see her composition, her skill right. at composition. Yes. What, what, what else would you need to be able to do to make a piece like this? Well, bend plastic and bend, I mean, that's not easy to control, I don't think. I mean, that's right. You have to, you have, you're shaping plastic in, in different kinds of plastic in many different ways. And then just the engineering sense of how to put it together and get it to stay together. <laughs> really, yes. I think that's a, that's a really great comment. The idea that you almost have to be a bit of an engineer to do these kind of large sculptures and the installations that so many um, artists work on these days. I would want to ask the artist whether they started sh with a pattern and tried to create something or just started out, you know, bending, twisting, melting, w all the different techniques and voila, there it is, or whether they actually started out with a plan in mind. Very good question, Laura. Would you, you say that this, um, uh, piece is um, pre-planned? Were there sketches or maquettes or if it, was it just spontaneous? The linear quality gives a hint that maybe she had something in mind um, ahead of time and then laid things into that wire structure that's underneath. I think it's almost like she had a certain concept and then just started going and, and <laughs> <laughs> um, Would you say that this piece is representational or abstract? Abstract. Well, going have... along with the fan fanciful feeling that I had or magical is, uh, again, there seems to be a snout and eye that a uh, uh, pantyhose that Billy was referring to looks like an eye to me. Uh, and the blue seems to be a mouth and the either earring or, or circular oh. is an ear, possibly. I don't know. Uh, and, but well, there's a long, again, we had talked about a dog on the previous one. So that was the first <laughs> thing I saw in this one. Um, the name of this piece is Dragon Arum. And when Dra Dragon first, what? Dragon Arum, A-R-U-M. And okay. I was surprised that when I Googled it, go ahead, um, Kelly, put up the picture. It's this flower. Oh, wow. Ah. Also called a stinking lily, because I guess <laughs> when, this, when this spike comes out for about three days, it gives a, a terrible odor. Um, but the, the way that this plant is, is sort of constructed is the flower, the, 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 place, the place where an animal would come to fertilize, is actually down in that uh, cow lily part, down in oh. the bottom. So the spike attracts the pollinator who goes way down into the, um, 
into the plant and gets covered with pollen and then and then moves on. So she's very um, she's very influenced by uh, by nature, and uh, I guess she keeps a big garden. Um, well, the green leaves certainly were are represented in that piece that you know on the right hand side of the sculpture. Now that I see these leaves, there's a lot of similarity. Yeah, she she does a nice um, job of abstracting something that she obviously has been inspired by. Uh, Kelly, can we go to the last slide? So this was done by uh, a living American artist. Her name is Judy Pfaff, and that's P-F-A-F-F. -F -F. She made her first installation as her MFA project at the suggestion of her teacher mentor, artist Al Held, who told her to fill the gallery with your work. <laughs> and she took it literally. Um, much, of, much of her work is done on commission for a specific place and ceases to exist after the exhibit is over. She works with an idea in her mind. You guys got it. You really understood this piece. She starts with an idea in her mind, but she creates completely spontaneously. So if she's working in a museum gallery, she and her crew come in with welders and torches and all kinds of plastic and found materials, and they actually create it spontaneously on the spot. Um, she also does paintings, drawings, and prints. And the Actional Art Museum is lucky enough to have a large Judy Pfaff print as part of our uh, permanent collection. I'm going to turn it back to you, Shauna. Okay, thank you. So let's look at our next work of art. Take some time to look at it. And say, what is going on with this work of art. Again, I see a figure, there's, you know, the, the neck becomes sort of a collar or almost like a, uh, a religious figure and a cone hat, possibly, and then obviously the drape of the robe. So it, it's abstract, but it implies to me, a religious figure of some sort. Could be mythological figure, but more religious. So you're seeing mm -hmm. a, a figure in this in the drapes with a hat and a collar? And the head wrap. And a row. And yeah. A row. yeah. Yes. And a shawl. Yeah. A shawl. I just see a um, scarf. I mean, it, it almost looks like something I would purchase if I walked into a... Uh, a museum store or a clothing store and, and they had this um, scarf on display um, with the colors and I can feel a bit that the textures especially the second part down not the part that maybe looks um, like the head but the yes that 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 gives me the sense that the scarf is um, like oh maybe chiffon like very thin so what's what is it that gives you that feeling of a of a scarf or um, a thin texture? Maybe just the colors, I um, or the way it's um, layered, if you will, from the the various pieces. It I, it looks like a long scarf to me that you could um, drape and knot and yeah, the draping. Yeah, the draping. draping right. Okay, so the draping also, to me, uh, is the the white in the front looks a little bit translucent like a chiffon scarf. Now that you've said yeah. scarf, all of a sudden that's what I'm I'm seeing. Anything else that we can say about this work of art? What about the color or the shapes or the three dimensionality of it? Well, the colors sort of run together to me, almost like a tie-dye kind of effect. Um, and, and there's numerous colors and numerous shades of the same colors as well. Going back to the idea of it being a figure, the, 
cone at the top has the center uh, section. It looks like it folds out outward. Maybe that's the head, and then there's a headdress, or you know, um, that comes off to the on each side, a narrow head, and then which again, you know, the scarf and shoulder wrap, and then the the uh, gown below, but gives a sense of dimensionality. All, all of it, the folds implies it's dimensional. The folds can, are kind of showing that. So this, um, what kind of mood does it evoke? If, if it's a figure, some people have said it's a figure and then it, uh, the cloth. Oh, Barbara can't hear you. I get the feeling that the artist is just experimenting with colors and running them on some kind of fabric and you know, almost like a tie dye, like a just it seems like um an experiment in colors to me. The the way the colors are faded in some places and stronger in other. It's um I don't know. So an experiment in color. So what do you think that that the outcome of that experiment is. Well, how do you feel about this, the it's color? Festive. It's festive. 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 It's, it's huh. festive, but it also has movement. For me, it's moving to the right. I, I feel a processional moving Ooh. to the right of, of the um, image. So this, um, someone said, I can't remember who said that it's almost like a, a a religious and you're saying processional so this yeah who, who knew um, so um, the materials anybody have an idea what the materials are if you're tie-dyeing something I to me it looks like canvas that's been stained a lot of painters would just stain an un um, you know, one that doesn't have any of the uh, backing, the white, I forget what you call it. But anyway, just stained canvas is what stained it looks canvas. like to me. Right. Okay. It hasn't been stretched. It hasn't been stretched. Right. Okay. Well, there's a, what's the white uh, sort of uh, old rabbits? Uh, uh, yeah, it's gesso. And that's just gesso, thank you. No and gesso. And no that's gesso. Called prime, and it's called priming the canvas. Right. Ex right. So this is unprimed, no priming. <laughs> unprimed, unprimed canvas yes. uh, that's kind of tie-dyed um, and it's, it's festive, uh, also a processional feeling. Um, looking at this on a flat screen um, versus uh, in person, do you think there's advantages one way or the other? Any thoughts on that? I, I think it loses its um, impact because it looks very, it does look very flat and I've seen it at the museum and it's, you know, it's quite imposing when you see it in person. Yeah. Uh, to me, I see movement in it, but I think it's been turned upside down because I think <laughs> the movement is from the top to the bottom because is it's right? all at the top and the colors uh, Interesting. all the way down to the bottom. But, okay. uh, but I, that's how I feel. I don't know. So, can anybody all, have any ideas? Oh, I'm sorry, Laurel, go ahead. Yeah, I was going to say, Barbara, can you see all around it? Like when it's displayed in the museum, is it like against a wall or is it in a cube where you could walk all around and It's see actually it? hung on the wall, yes. But it's large and yes. it, it's more, it's like, this, this has a flat feeling to me. I don't see yeah. any... Well, there is a little bit of a shadow, but you can't see the dimensions of it. And I think the size and when it's hanging on the wall, it has a more imposing presence than... Yeah. What is the size of it? The size is nine feet by four feet. Oh, wow. Yes, so it would be very imposing. Nine feet by four feet. Um, yeah. the, the artist is Sam Gilliam, and it's called Wall Circle One. And uh, Sam Gillian, it was born in Tupelo, Mississippi, uh, moved to Louisville, Kentucky shortly thereafter. He's seventh of eight children. Um, he was encouraged by his fifth grade art teacher. How many people can say that, that they are inspired by their art teachers? Um, graduated from the uh, University of Louisville with bachelor and master's of fine art, taught school for a year, 
and moved to Washington, D.C. And in 1965, he was the first painter to introduce the idea of unsupported canvases, partially inspired by women hanging laundry. Now, this one is not one of those, but if you look him up on Google, you'll see some of those that are inspired by that. Um, during the late 70s, he discovered that by cutting geometric shapes from thickly painted canvases, he could expand his experiences in color and improvisation. So this experiment, Barbara, that you talk about, um, kind of right, right, um, right there. And for the past 25 years, Sam Gillian has been internationally recognized as the foremost contemporary African-American color field painter. So anybody have any idea about how this might have been constructed? Shauna, Martha yes. had a question. Uh, yeah, oh, and I Martha, was, my yes. question was kind of, is kind of apropos to this, because my question was, is if it's installed in, in a museum or a gallery in the museum, and then it's put back in the collection and then it's reinstalled, are there any guidelines? Are there drawings? Are there photos so that who, the, whoever, the installer knows how to drape it? Or is it, does it change every time it's reinstalled? Kelly, you have any idea on that one? With, I, with this artist, it, it's different with every artist because there are artists that when they ha have a piece taken apart, they have very, very specific instructions about how it should be hung in the next place. But Sam Gilliam likes the preparators and the curators to hang it however they think it looks best in their place. So he's very, um, he likes them to participate. Each of the places that it hangs, it, maybe it's a little bit different because of the way um, people have worked with it. Lynn, have you seen it installed here in different ways? I haven't been here long enough to see it more than the way that it is right now. This one, because of the way it's constructed, and Shauna and I talked about this when we were putting the presentation together. I, I, I don't know exactly how it's constructed, but because it said wall circle, I have this thought that possibly the original canvas was a circle, a really big circle, which he picked up by the center. And what you're seeing is kind of the hat on top is the center. And then he kind of, he tied a knot in it. I'm not sure if that's the case or not. But we don't know that. This is our imagination. This going is our imagination, us. but that's how I saw it. He has many other pieces that are horizontal and that hang from some kind of cording. And those can be bunched up or stretched out depending on how the exhibiting um, institution wants to show it. Are they all numbered? Like I see wall circle one, that implies that there's more wall circle two, three, or is this? I did not see any wall circle twos <laughs> when I was doing research, but obviously I don't have uh, access to his complete works. I had another question. And in fact, a couple of years after he finished this one, um, he moved away into another kind of art. So he moved away from the unconstructed canvases. So I think in, in 1978, probably eight or nine, he moved away from this, this type of um, art. It says partial gift and partial museum purchase. And I know a lot of items are gifts or gifts from estates of children. And a lot of um, items the museum actually purchases. This is a partial gift and partial purchase. I was just wondering how that um, came about or how many pieces in the museum are of that way. I have no knowledge. Kelly, do you have any? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, keep going back to you. <laughs> uh, well, you know, I'm not a great source because I've only been here for just over a year um, and I don't know the specifics of this situation um, with the partial gift. Lynn, you've been with with the museum for much, much longer than me. Do you have any idea? 
Well, I think it's, it's really helpful that everybody knows that um, much of the acquisitions that are made by the museum are gifts. We don't have a big acquisition budget. And as anybody who follows the art market knows, contemporary art has become very expensive. We do have a wonderful group of donors and a particular group called Collector's Circle. The people in Collector's Circle uh, commit a certain amount of money each year to be part of Collector's Circle. And at the end of the year, that money is compiled and the curators bring in um, uh, a selection of works that they would like to have added to the permanent collection. And then the collector circle decides which ones they can purchase. So one of the remarkable things about the Asheville Art Museum is unlike most art museums, it, it wasn't started by collectors, it was started by artists. Um, and so the Potter Palmers and the Rockefellers and things who donated large collections to um, museums in other cities. We didn't have anyone like that, but we have wonderful donors um, who help us get wonderful things. Thank you, Lynn, for that insight. I did not know that before. How do the curators get the uh, works of art that they bring to the collective circle to choose from? If they don't already own them, how, how do they get them to show that? Um, very often we'll have people, donors who might live in the area or visit here and be uh, impressed with the museum and they'll call uh, either the executive director or the curator and say, I have things that I'm ready to part with. Would oh. someone like to come and take a look? And the curators and Pam Meyer, our executive director, constantly watch galleries, auctions, um, for and other exhibitions for things that might come to market. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Sometimes a curator will have a particular interest in an artist that they're following um, and or have a relationship with an artist or a collector. Um, and then they, you know, they bring things to the table that way too. And the, the board, the museum board, had, there is a focus on five areas of collecting. We, we're a Museum of American Art and um, we have Focus, you know, a focus in craft, in uh, works in the Southeast, in Black Mountain, and in a couple of other areas that we're just always monitoring and looking for something that might enhance our collection. Well, thank you all. Any, if you have any other questions, this would be the time. Otherwise, thank you for attending. Thanks. Kelly, for hosting this. Um, next Thanks. week, there is Thanks, an. Donna, for planning this. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you. Uh, there is a, another one, uh, and probably we will continue these each Friday with. I know that we're booked out through October 30th for sure with these slow art Fridays. If um, you want to um, stop by and sign up for these, keep a, an eye out by following the Asheville Art Museum. Facebook page, Instagram, or as a member. Yes. Thank you, everybody, for coming. Thank you, Shauna and Lynn, for leading Thank our you. program today. Uh, next week, we hope you'll join us. The conversation is called Is It Art? Part 3, and that will be led by touring docent Hank Bovey. And I've, I've watched his other Is It Art ones, and he's really good. It's definitely one to try to make if you have the time. Absolutely. That. Yes. Enjoy the rest of your day, everyone. Okay. Thank you, everyone. Bye.